Hi, we are live now. Welcome to USA Today Book Club. I'm Barbara Vandenberg, Books Editor for USA Today, and I am joined today by reporter Pam Avila and our special guest, author Silvia Moreno-Garcia, to talk about her, what I think is an insanely cool new book, Silver Nitrate, and also my favorite book cover of the year so far. Not that that's the most important thing, but this is a really cool book cover. <laughs> um, Sylvia has been an incredibly prolific author in the past decade. She's written nine novels and over 70 short stories, including the bestseller Mexican Gothic, Velvet Was the Night, and The Daughter of Dr. Moreau. Sylvia, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Pam, who uh, also interviewed you for a features piece that ran in USA Today last week when your book came out. Um, so hi, Sylvia. Nice to talk to you again about Silver Nitrate. I think there's just so many things to talk about when it comes to this book. Um, but first and foremost, I guess to set the foundation for readers and people that are still um, choosing to you know, pick up this book from their TBR piles. Uh, Silver Nitrate is set in the thriving 90s Mexico City film industry. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that and about whether there were any films of that time that inspired you to write the book? Uh, yes, yeah, Silver Nitrate is a supernatural suspense novel. It's set in 1993 in Mexico City. It's actually not the thriving film industry. It's uh, the dregs of the industry. The golden age of cinema in Mexico was in the 40s and 50s, and then it went through a downward spiral. And by 1993, there's um, uh, almost nothing left of that industry. It's falling apart. By the end of the decade, I think in 1997 or 1998, um, we will have only a handful of films being produced a year. So things are going from, from bad to worse. As to did any films inspire this novel? Yes, a number of them. Everything from some of the older black and white stuff that it would be closer to uh, the time when Beyond the Yellow Door is being produced, which is a novel mentioned, which is a movie mentioned within the novel. Um, Things like El Vampiro or uh, black and white films or the early Hammer films with Christopher Lee, but also 1970s movies such as Alucarda, which was an English language production but made in Mexico with all Mexican actors, directed by Lopez Moctezuma, who also directed a number of other films, including horror. Mm -hmm. And the majority of your books are also set in Mexico and, you know, infused with Mexican history, uh, culture and politics play a big role in in many of your novels. Um, why is it important for you to, you know, keep writing Mexico into your fiction and depicting it in the way that you do, whether it's um, like you're saying, you know, the golden age of cinema and also when it, things get bad to worse? Uh, well, I mean, I, I grew up in Mexico and uh, that's where I come from. And uh, it's a part of me, just like uh, I think growing up any other place, some some place would be a part of some other people's childhood and identity. I like to write many different books that showcase different aspects of Mexico because often what we get is a very simplistic picture um, of what it is. Uh, binary kind of portrait where we have either uh, narcos, criminals, or perhaps uh, people who are uh, mowing the, the grass, that kind of uh, portrait of Mexico. And uh, it's not that there are not uh, people who mow the grass for a living in Mexico, or that there are not criminals in Mexico, but there is a wide variety of uh, people in, in history to the country. If I told you that uh, the entirety of the history of the United States could be represented just by, I don't know, Bruce Willis and Die Hard and that was it and there was no other kind of portrayal of Americanness, you would be pretty miffed and it's the same thing for me. I want to show a Mexico that is richer and more complex than most people understand. That involves looking back at some of its history, but also looking at the different social strata and the different people that inhabit Mexico. So in Silver that, and Silver Nitrate, one of the two protagonists is Tristan and he's a Lebanese Mexican man 
which I think a lot of people might be like, why is there a Lebanese guy in Mexico? Why are there Lebanese people in Mexico? And it's because there was a, a substantial immigration wave of Lebanese people at a certain point early in the 20th century in Mexico. They became established by the middle of the 20th century and so became part of Mexican society. But most people wouldn't think, you know, Lebanese Mexican. That's mm. where Salma Hayek comes from. She is Lebanese Mexican. And uh, and going off of that, you know, just off of the Mexican politics and the history there, Silver Nitrate also explores these uh, themes of classism within, um, you know, the telenovela industry and the film industry that I think that we also spoke about in, in, the, in our interview and just how those things are sort of portrayed through Tristan, who's, you know, um, who's a, the, he's a bit of a washed up telenovela actor, but he's described as being handsome and things like that. Whereas uh, Montserrat plays a, a role that's more of, you know, behind the scenes. She's a studio engineer, a studio sound engineer and things like that. So can you elaborate more on like, um, on how Silver Nitrate touches on those uh, topics that you're talking about when it comes to, you know, um, Mexican classism and the hierarchy that exists within um, the film industry specifically? Well, Mexico has always been a colorist society. So there's a pyramid that establishes where you sit on that social ranking. And so the whiter you are, the better it is. And the darker you are, the worse it is. And that is why if you look at soap operas, especially um, if you're looking at 1990s soap operas, you suddenly see a lot of uh, blonde people and light-skinned people, and you don't see many darker people, uh, people who look indigenous, or if they are, they are just in background roles. They are the maid or things like that, and they're not given uh, primary roles. And it's because of this idea of um, uh, whiteness being desirable, and that's one of the subtopics of the of the novel, but it's because, uh, yeah, it is very prevalent. Um, one saying that is very common in Mexico, I think still nowadays, and certainly was extremely common when I was growing up, is mejorar la raza, which means better the race. And that means that you should marry whiter people. So you want to improve, kind of like bring more milk into the chocolate and kind of improve mm -hmm. um, the family strain with more white people. And that's just a, you know, it's a post-colonial legacy and it's a reality of who we are, not only in Mexico, but all across Latin America, the things we value that we consider um, better are, are tied to Europeanness, to whiteness. And that also plays a role in the narrative uh, in the shape of um, characters like uh, uh, the villain of the novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and can you talk to us a little bit more about the the villain of the novel and how he and how that represents um, that white supremacist discourse, because you know, in your acknowledgments as well, when you're talking about um, the the character of Ewers and the Nazi occultism, and then also relating it to these like colorist Mexican politics, and talking about how you know, um, had Ewers kind of existed in that time, you know, either side wouldn't be so surprised by you know either's politics. Um, so, can you talk to us a little bit more about? infusing that Nazi occultism within silver nitrate um, and just creating these kind of really layered conversations about um, about these themes. So the, the villain Evers is based on several real occultists. It's, he's an amalgamation of several of them, but one of the, but he's named after one specifically, and that's a writer whose last name is Evers. Um, and he, was a writer, novelist, short story writer, also a screenwriter, like the sound, uh, the silent era. He was also a correspondent with uh, Crowley. So he was interested in occultism and he was uh, a pro-Nazi sympathizer. And uh, later on, it didn't work out so well for him because uh, it turned out that he was either gay or bisexual. And so they kind of shunned him, but he was very much uh, kind of a, uh, supportive of the Nazi cause. So Evers is um, uh, the real writer, a real writer called Hans Evers is an inspiration for my fictional movie uh, uh, screenwriter uh, who's uh, trying to make a film in, in 1961 in Mexico City. Uh, but he was not the only one. I actually ended up uh, doing a lot of research on the history of occultism and spent some 
a considerable amount of time looking at German occultisms. And there was often a vein of uh, racist thought embedded into some of these um, occultist um, ideas. It's hard to explain it. Uh, sometimes you kind of see it and you're like, aha, but one easy explanation is the ancient aliens theory, which, which is actually still quite popular nowadays, but emerges kind of like in the early 20th century. And that is the idea that great constructions such as pyramids in Latin America uh, could not have been created by the native indigenous people. They had to be made by somebody else. And, and so there's this idea that maybe this superior Aryan race uh, helped these people make these pyramids or they made them and then they left them behind. And it's just this very racist, con this racist concept because most people don't look at something like Buckingham Palace and they say, well, that's a gigantic mega structure. It could not have been constructed by, uh, you know, people with uh, more primitive, quote unquote, technology. Mm -hmm. And yet it was. I mean, uh, so that's one way in which sometimes occultism and some of these uh, ideas kind of flourish together. And and there were other ways in which it, it manifested, too. But it just it was just this vein of uh, seeing occultism and racism kind of coexisting and sometimes going hand in hand since uh, way before um, the Nazis come on board. We're talking about the late 1800s. It's already kind of brewing. But obviously, when the Nazis come on board, uh, they become some interested in some weird theories such as the hollow earth theory or the ancient aliens theory or these other theories that mix some of that occultist thought with racist ideologies or they help underpin racist ideologies and prop them up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you were doing the research for this book and, and reading all of these texts that, um, you know, dealt with German occultists, I know um, you talked about how you were, it was like, it kind of came about from like reading a footnote and then just going on down a rabbit hole of, of research, but how, um, how was the process of kind of um, figuring out how to break down this very kind of complicated legacy and history into something that would, you know, work in a fiction book and wouldn't be so, uh, I guess, heavy on the complicatedness when it comes to like the language and understanding um, what Nazi occultism like truly is. Well, there's some sections of the novel in which we get to read an occult book that is uh, penned by um, Evers and we get to kind of read some of these passages and see some of the thought process of how the magic kind of works. And those are supposed to mimic some uh, kind of occult books that I read and not exactly in the content, but just in the way that they feel. They sometimes feel uh, very dense in, mm -hmm. in what you're reading. And so uh, so you're getting some of that. But obviously, I mean, you're not just getting that. You're, you're getting two characters, one of them who is Montserrat, and she's a sound editor in 1993 in Mexico City. And the other is her best friend, a soap opera actor named Tristan. And they're both suddenly trapped in this web of the supernatural intruding into the mundane. And you get um, the first few chapters of Silver Nitrate are very realist in the sense that it's just them kind of going about their lives. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there's several reasons. But one reason is because I feel that if they really need to anchor you. Um, and they really need to guide you to a certain time of, and place. And it's only once you're firmly anchored in this, in their reality and in the mundanity of their lives and how they're struggling to pay their rent. Tristan can't get work anymore. He's doing voiceover work. Uh, Montserrat is facing a very sexist environment in Mexico City where she's the only woman in an audio company. Once you are in this kind of reality of paper, people just living their everyday lives and being in Mexico City, that's when the supernatural begins to happen. And mm -hmm. I think that's necessary because otherwise you don't understand who these people are and the context of what's happening and the love of cinema that's also included in this novel. And so for me, that helps you draw you into the supernatural aspect where yes, there is um, a lot of talk about complicated magic, 
and racist uh, theoretical underpinnings, but you are going hand in hand with these two people who have already kind of are helping you go along that journey. And um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask about Montserrat and your um, how you created that character. And I, I found her such a fascinating, immediately grounding character in a world that um, was outside of my was outside of my knowledge, really. And she was so grounding. And I, I love her name. I love that you got her doing a technical job in an industry in which even still to this day, even, you know, across cultures is still dominated by men. Most of, you know, sound editors, uh, cinematographers, a lot of the technical work is still dumb, is still very male dominated. And I just wanted to know more about how you created Montserrat and why you um, decided to have her be a sound engineer in this very male dominated um, industry. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a world of sound. My parents both worked in radio and my grandfather also worked in radio. So that was the environment that I grew up in. My mother was the first uh, female voice at the WABC, the University of Baja California. So there were no female announcers until she went on the air in the 1970s. Uh, my father was also a radio announcer. They worked together doing radio shows and programs. Um, my mother had a really good ear. Uh, and so she would sometimes be called in to do some complicated edits. So obviously she was an announcer, but she also knew how to manage the machines and how to do edits. And she had a very fine hand and a really good ear. So they would, some, my father would sometimes call her in because he was, you know, the producer on the show and, and would ask her for help for doing some of this editing. And she would do it. And sometimes some of the audio engineers would also ask her for help. And she would hear it and she would cut it and she would do it perfectly. And, and and then my father was the one who got the credit because you know because she didn't because he was the the producer and she was just the talent mm -hmm. and um and so that so that was an interesting thing so she talked to me about that and uh and how that worked and yeah every time that i was in radio there were no female sound technicians i never met a single female sound technician when i was growing up they were all men I worked also briefly in post-production. And when I was working in post-production, I was the only woman on staff, except for the receptionist who didn't do any technical work. So behind the line, behind uh, the desk, I was the only woman. And it was um, it was a really interesting uh, kind of job. And it wasn't a bad uh, job. I made a lot of good friends. Uh, actually, one of my friends, I consulted for some of the uh, editing, some editing questions in this novel. But um, but it's but it was definitely a different uh, a different world and it's a different environment. So I wanted to kind of show a little bit of that, of what it felt like and how it was sometimes kind of a bit alien and off and off putting and and outright hostile in certain places, depending on what kind of job were you working and uh, but also fascinating at the same time. So there's a lot of love for audio in this novel and a lot of love for cinema and and the craft that it takes to make something sound engineers in general are not very well regarded in the sense that most people don't really think about who did the sound mixing in a movie but if you can't hear the dialogue you will sure as hell complain about it so it's um, a very technical job but it's not one that kind of trusts you into the limelight, but it's a very necessary one. And just the personalities that gravitate towards that kind of work, towards editing, I've always found very interesting. It takes a special kind of person to really do that kind of job and do it well. And I mean, um, you know, how, kind of how you're saying right now, like uh, sound mixing isn't something that, you know, you go into a film really... I guess, paying attention to when it comes to that craft. But for example, in Silver Nitrate, if I guess if it hadn't been for, you know, Montserrat's uh, um, background and line of work, then, you know, who knows where the this uh, ending of, um, of Urieta's uh, film, like, you know, where it would have gone, because the thing that they needed the most was that sound aspect as well, aside from, um, you know, trying to, I guess, not spoiler alert, but um, to those who have read it, like trying to, you know, finish the 
the final scene of that film in order to revert some curses and some spells. So that's um, that's interesting now thinking of it that way. Uh, yeah, you can think about watching any kind of big action film, like a Star Wars film, and just think about watching it without uh, the sound effects and the scoring and the voices interacting in the proper way, and it would not it would not be the same <laughs> uh, rousing experience that it is. And going off a little bit more about um, just what you were talking about briefly beforehand um, about setting up this, uh, you know, really setting up the foundation for uh, Montserrat and Tristan and and uh, and getting a feel for who they are as characters so we can, you know, connect with them and then really understand what they do on a day to day. And then I think that really helped kind of see how they were see how they were each differently influenced by um, Evers and this, um, like you also mentioned, this like seduction of, you know, of power and this, uh, how it, how their, how each of the shortcomings kind of led them to each have a different relationship with that power. So I think, and then I think towards the ending, um, we, you know, we see that the big bad has kind of already been, uh, like resolved, but at the ending of the book, is there a possibility you think that um, either either character held on to Ever's power in some way um, to you know continue to feel a little bit more control of their life that they that they didn't feel beforehand? Uh, well, I, I don't want to spoil the book for the people who uh, who haven't read it, uh, but uh, I will just uh, say that I like to create narratives that are a little bit more open-ended. So there, I, it's not a question that I ask myself what happens after, mm -hmm. the, after the story ends, but there's a certain degree of um, open-endedness in most of my narratives. That's just uh, what it is. And um, as someone who, you know, challenges themselves as a fiction writer, uh, when it comes to working across different genres and um, and like you're saying, also leaving these ended uh, open-ended narratives at the end of uh, some of your books, um, what's some advice that you would give to other writers that are wanting to do the same and um, and wanting to challenge themselves when it comes to, you know, not just pigeonholing themselves into a certain genre, but um, thinking of it in a different and more like expansive way? Uh, well, I, I mean, every writer's... Uh path is is quite different and uh, I don't think there is a, a mold that I can uh, tell people to follow but generally you should do what feels uh, right for you. One of the things that happens is that sometimes people I think feel that they should chase a trend. For example, if pirate books are hot, I should write a pirate book that imitates this very successful pirate book and that generally doesn't end up fairly well for the most part because at a very simple level the industry moves so slowly that by the time you finish writing your pirate book pirates are maybe out of vogue now it's two three years later and it's no longer hot so it's a it's a pretty difficult um, uh, thing to do so I think that ultimately writers just need to really focus on the work that truly interests them and moves them rather than attempting to perhaps uh, do the same thing that somebody else has done. And I also read that you earned a master's degree in science and technology studies at uh, the University of British Columbia. And I wanted to ask if uh, if those studies influenced or shifted your writing style or your writing approach at all, or, or uh, rather also your reason for um, pursuing that type of uh, master's work? Uh, it did not change the way I write fiction. It's a very different thing to do academic research than to write fiction. Mm -hmm. So it did not influence uh, my fictional writing. It did allow me to develop skills, uh, research skills in uh, in a fine-tuned kind of way and discover sources that I might not have been able to bump up uh, with 
otherwise. And it just gave me a chance to think about uh, concepts in an um, interesting way that I might not, might not have tackled before. But academia and fiction are two very different beasts. And so mm -hmm. they don't necessarily mix uh, very well. But uh, in terms of uh, perhaps influencing some of the criticism that I might be able to write nowadays, if I wanted to write uh, an analysis on a uh, on a on a book, or uh, I've done a, I did an introduction to Dracula, for example, that should be out this year for a publisher, and that definitely it's an introduction that is more academic leaning perhaps than some of the other work that I might have done a number of years before. And mm. part of that is because I wanted to be in that mindset, be in that space for that kind of, uh, of introduction. So it, it just uh, allowed me to develop a different kind of muscle in my brain to put it that way. But it's generally the stuff that you don't see in the background where the academic stuff might be present and not hopefully so much on the page because when you do a, an analysis of a text in that way it's the dissection is very specific and it's probably not uh, so readable to the average person mm -hmm. and uh, i also recently read the um your opinion piece for the la times where you you wrote that by labeling uh, Mex Mexican Gothic, which was uh, your novel published in 2020, I believe, um, how labeling that a Gothic and horror novel, um, how it allowed editors to imagine the possibility of more titles existing on the horror shelf, a space uh, that has mostly been perceived out of bounds for Latin American authors. Um, and I wanted to ask, how does it feel to have helped open those doors for other authors of color um, that want to, you know, step into uh, those genres and take space up on that shelf? Well, it's it's very pleasant, and uh, there were uh, there have been a couple of people that have used my title as a comp title, uh, which is something that is used in publishing when you're trying to sell a book and, or when you're send, sending the book out to publicists where you say this book is like such and such mm -hmm. title and such and such title. And when you don't have an appropriate comp title, it, it can be sometimes more difficult to make that very brief uh, introduction of the title. So if you have a book like Mexican Gothic that somebody can compare if they're writing a horror story, it might make it easier for publicists to understand what this book is about and to imagine it in what space it should be, but also for acquiring editors to imagine how they might position it. So I have been used as a comp title now a number of times, and I am very happy when it's for writers of color. Mm -hmm. And um, who have been some of your favorite authors uh, growing up that um, have just inspired you and influenced you mm -hmm. and that you just hold deeply when you're um, thinking about literature? Well, I think the one that everybody kind of uh, relates to me is H.P. Lovecraft because I did a lot of work related to H.P. Lovecraft for a while. So he was certainly very influential. I mean, Poe, Lovecraft, all the, all the, all the classics. The Silver Nitrate opens with an epigraph by Henry James, who is both a literary author, we, he does very serious dramas such as Washington Square, which I love. And he is also basically the godfather of the ghost story. We get uh, a number of ghost stories from him. Probably the most analyzed ghost story of all time is The Turn of the Screw, and that's Henry James. It's a very um, kind of interesting narrative that can be interpreted in one way or the other, which is probably by why scholars have been fighting about it for decades and decades. So obviously, I mean, Henry James uh, is, is part of that, of that canon, but, you know, you go through to time and then you encounter Shirley Jackson and, and, you know, so on and so forth. So it's a really wide body of work. And I like to read very widely and explore a lot of different spaces. And uh, what are some books right now that you're reading that you've been really into um, or 
or that have, you know, kept you up at night that have been more on like the scary ghost story um, side? I just learned a book called Moth Town. Moth has in the thing with wings and town is in a place that exists on a map. It's not exactly a ghost story. It is um, quite surreal, but it does involve a sense of mystery and the unknown. And I found it very, very riveting. So that, so that was quite, uh, quite an interesting narrative. Um, don't think I've been reading that much horror lately. And I think Moth Town is speculative and not necessarily horror. Um, I've been reading other stuff <laughs> recently, so I'm not sure I can't uh, comment specifically on ghost stories. But I mean, for Silver Nitrate, I, I went back and I reread some huge classic titles such as Ghost Story, which is Straub and is magnificent. It's, I think, early 80s, and that, that's quite lovely. Um, Silver Nitrate is not quite a ghost story, but there is a sense of the supernatural in there. And what else? Can I recommend? I mean, obviously Shirley Jackson and the and the Haunting of Hill House. She does magnificent work with with that novel. Mm. Who else? Those are the big ones. And and then obviously Silver Nitrate ha has a big debt with film, which is not mm -hmm. written work, but nevertheless manifests in the in the text. And in in that sense, I think I already mentioned Alucarda, which is a bizarre. Uh, 1970s horror film and it is like i said with an all english cast uh, they speak english but it's shot in mexico it's a mexican director and mexican actors it's a mixture between a vampire story and the exorcist it's a very bizarre movie and the director uh, lopez Moctezuma, is an incredibly interesting man he started working in radio and then he started working in theater and he was really an avant-garde uh, artist and in one of his movies not not Alucarda but another one Leonora Carrington who is an extremely good surrealist painter did some of the backgrounds I believe for that uh, for that movie so he was a, a very curious guy but he emerges at a time period in Mexican cinema where it's in decay like I said so so he's doing a lot of exploitative films to get by but he also really seems to love a certain kind of horror aesthetic, which he deploys very effectively, even when he has very small budgets. So obviously, um, some of Moctezuma's aesthetic seeps into the novel. Some of Dario Argento's aesthetic seeps into the novel. I very much love his films. And I was really thinking a lot about his Suspiria and Inferno, the first two of the Mother's Trilogy and the use of color that they have um, and some of the set pieces that they have in those movies. A little bit about the black and white movies that were done like El Vampiro and El Ataúd del Vampiro, The Vampire and the Vampire's Coffin, mm -hmm. uh, those two. So it's not just, uh, there. there is, I was, when I was thinking about this book, I was trying to, I was thinking about what happens when you take a traditional Henry James ghost story narrative, which is very iconic, and you move it kind of into the space of somebody like Lopez Moctezuma with Alucarda, what happens when those, those two currents meet is really one of the thought processes that I was having about how aesthetically this should feel. And for people who have not experienced both of these, this might be like, mm -hmm. what, are, what is she talking about? But mm -hmm. it's just, essentially two very different vibes. One of them, Henry James, is coming from the British, uh, from the that, yeah, kind of Anglo tradition of the ghost story of, oh, it's an old gentleman with a pipe telling a story in front of a fireplace and he is an antiquarian and he's talking about a mysterious book that he found and it's that kind of tradition. And then you have uh, this very wild, uh, vibrant, almost surrealist experience that you get when you're watching something like a Lucarna and mm -hmm. or a Dario Argento film. And it's a completely different space. And yet it they're coming together. Or that's what I was hoping to feel when the mm -hmm. book was done. And speaking of film, uh, 
we know that Mexican Gothic, or I don't know if you know many know, but Mexican Gothic is being um, adapted into a limited Hulu series. Um, for Silver Nitrate, do you um, envision it perhaps, you know, kind of turning into a film of its own? Um, and is that something that you would be open to if the opportunity kind of presented itself? Uh, well, open to, yes. Uh, the reality is that uh, for something to go from a book to being adapted and to actually ending up on screen is a really long process that often does not happen. And the reality on the ground right now, as we speak, is that both the Actors Guild and the Screenwriters Guild are on strike for very good reasons. So there is essentially no deals that are being made right now at this yeah. point that have anything related to adaptations from books or anything like that. Uh, but I do encourage people to look up information about the writer screenwriter strike and the actor strike because they're striking uh, in order to preserve uh, this uh, wonderful world of, of cinema and TV and of telling stories to audiences. Yeah, definitely. Um, and for one of my last questions, uh, or for my last question, um, like we mentioned earlier, you know, for the past eight years, you've just been nonstop writing and publishing uh, book after book. And in 2024, you actually have a 10th book out um, titled The Seventh Veal of Salome. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about what readers can expect? I know to the extent that you can and um, and how it will feel different from the rest of your work, which I know, you know, every single book has been completely uh, different, exploring different things. Uh, yes, The Seventh Veil of Salome should be out in July of 2024. It's set in 1950s Hollywood. It's about the making of a sword and sandals movie. So if anybody remembers or maybe their grandparents or their parents watch things like uh, The Ten Commandments or Ben-Hur, it's that kind of movie that is being shot in Hollywood. And it's about uh, three different characters and it's related to that. So that should be out next year. And it's not a genre piece. It's a historical drama mm -hmm. straight up. Well, thank you, Sylvia, for uh, speaking with us. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to uh, let readers know about Silver Nitrate and um, and what to expect when they pick up the book, uh, the floor is yours. But thank you again for speaking with us and for um, choosing to talk to us for our book club this month. Uh, yeah, I would just conclude by saying that although uh, Silver Nitrate is a supernatural suspense novel, um, and it does have those elements of the horrific or of the fantastic. At its core, it's a story about two best friends who go on a journey together. And so if the words horror fiction scare you, know that, uh, that you can look at it from that angle. And perhaps mm -hmm. it will be appealing. And it's out now. So check it out. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks. Have a good time, everybody.